and um, welcome to the New York Public Library. I'm Jean Strauss, the director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the library. Um, we have what promises to be a terrific program here this evening, and I'm only going to take about a minute of it. But I do want to thank everyone who worked to help make this happen, especially our co-sponsors live from the New York Public Library and the Century Foundation, um, and of course the participants in the program, three of whom have come from out of town for this occasion. Um, Patrick Keefe, who had to travel only from Brooklyn, um, uh, wrote his book, Chatter, Dispatches from the Secret World of Global Eavesdropping, while he was a fellow at the Coleman Center two years ago. He made his other fellows extremely envious since he started in September and turned it in in May, which no one else has been able to do. Um, I should just quickly say that Admiral Inman is a hero to be here tonight because he's not been well. So if he makes a quick exit, um, it is not because of the content of the conversation, but because he's not feeling well. Um, so I hope that took less than a minute, and it's a pleasure to turn the evening over to Paul Holdenbaber, who is director of the public programs for the research libraries, now called Live from the NYPL. Believe it or not, indeed, my name is Paul Holmgraber, and I am the director of public programs now known as Live from the New York Public Library. It's been a pleasure collaborating with Gene Strauss on a number of programs. Recently, I had the pleasure of in interviewing Edmund White um, here at the library. I couldn't think of two events more different than the one we're doing today, and having Edmund White here um, uh, months ago or so. And we will be doing another event with Slate magazine that is celebrating its 10 years of existence in about one month. It, it probably is my upbringing that, that makes me ask such questions. I was wondering, you know, where does the word eavesdropping come from? And I remember that when I interviewed in Los Angeles Philip de Montebello, I was asking myself the same question, not about eavesdropping, but about blockbusters. Where does the word blockbuster come from? And as you all know, blockbuster comes from the Second World War, where one busted a block. And the contrary of a blockbuster is a bomb, a complete failure. But eavesdropping. <laughs> <laughs> and his replacement with Michael Hayden. All of us are eager to know what to think of these momentous events. And you see before you a dream team of the surveillance world, uh, which will enlighten us on these matters. Let me introduce them briefly. They're all well known to you, and we'll start our psychoanalytic session. Uh, James Risen. Uh, 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 at home and in their international calls. Uh, after 9-11, so I sent them down for approval and instantly got back while well, they're trying to trap the president. So I let the warrants expire, and we stopped the surveillance. And within two weeks, I got, where's the product? That was very valuable. He said, you didn't sign the warrants authorized. I'm not going to proceed. Well, got them down here. And they were signed quickly, and coverage was resumed. And at that point, I went to see two members of the Senate and said, there has to be a better way where you're not caught in, when administrations change, the issue of whether this is some kind of political trap as opposed to valuable requirements. However, it came the FISA court. Uh, six, in the initial days, <laughs> six uh, judges who were uh, from the appeal court state, selected by Attorney General. Um, all of the hearings, everything about the ones done in closed session. But they were tough. Or both, what is the purpose? What are you going to get? What is its intended use? And they always focused on, what if you inadvertently collect on US citizens? Because that first word of the foreign, of the FISA court, foreign intelligence surveillance was fucked up. And so a whole series of processes were put in place. I did not have the vision in 1978, to think about a world where people would come to this country on legitimate visas and spend weeks, months, training, planning, and then executing attacks. Nothing in the whole process of the court was structured 
to think about that kind of a target in the process. It was a totally different approach for criminal activity, or a new criminal activity, but you didn't go to FISA court initially. You went to normal judges. The other thing I didn't envision was the dramatic shift from analog to digital communication. The speed up. And what that meant both enabling surveillance. Notwithstanding all of the good movies and television programs, computers still, an overwhelming target, cannot sort voice communications. Only people can. But digital and computers can sort, identify uh, in incredibly short time frames. And that means the lead, what numbers are being dialed, how they're being dialed suddenly could be accessible in the kind of time frame that you could do warning, preventive attack. My understanding, and happily I have no access to the program, <laughs> uh, my understanding is I've tried to track and understand, and candidly, much of my understanding comes from those members of Congress who had been briefed, who still occasionally consult. Um, in the immediate aftermath, The White House asked NSA, are there any other prospective attackers out there? And I don't have a problem on an emergency basis going to scan and say, are there other? Because it turns out there have been a lot of phone calls back and forth between those who conducted the attacks, moving money, other things in the process, which could have been tips for warning if you'd known what you were looking for you understood it, and if you could gotten it in a timely way. My problem is in not going to the Congress to revise the statute to deal with the issues that I simply wasn't smart enough to think about in 78. And we can come back to that later. I think there are a number of ways you could have done it. But here, he said it publicly, so the Vice President, who was chief of staff to President Ford when the president still authorized Jackson said, we don't need law. President has authorized these in the past and can authorize them now. And that's why no activity moved forward to pursue changing the law to do under the courts. That's very helpful, and I will ask you later about what a statute uh, regulating this program might actually look like. Right. But I want to ask Patrick Keith, the, the Admiral has offered an extremely uh, modest defense of the program. On an emergency basis, it might be useful. So what's the problem with allowing for warrantless surveillance on an emergency basis? Civil libertarians give lots of hypothetical nightmare scenarios, but no concrete examples of abuses. Why should we actually care? about this program from a privacy perspective? Well, I, I think that the, it's interesting that the Admiral mentioned uh, that one of the things that was going on was not so much necessarily listening in on particular calls as looking at who is being called. And I think that it's easy when, when we say wiretap or eavesdrop, there's a, um, it, there's a misconception, which is that you have kind of 50s era G-man, you know, in a trench coat, listen, tapping a particular wire and listening to all of the phone calls that are happening there. And I think what, what is going on, quite possibly in this program, and certainly in others that the NSA uh, is employing, is more of a sort of a mile wide and an inch deep uh, in terms of the approach. So it's not necessarily that you have uh, actual agents or even computers sifting through the actual conversations and correspondences of tens of thousands of people. Uh, a lot of the time it's, it's what they might call uh, link, link analysis or data mining. So in fact, what you're looking at is traffic patterns and the, the aggregate patterns of who's calling who. So there's a threshold question, which if you're, if you're working for the NSA, you have to answer, which is uh, who, in fact, should we be listening to? And one of the ways that they're going about that, we know, is through uh, these various sophisticated uh, software algorithms that say you have, I mean, in the, in the, the president's um, uh, effective, slightly disingenuous phrase, uh, you know, if, Al if Al Qaeda is calling you, we want to know why. Um, so say you have Al Qaeda calling you. <laughs> It's not just that we want to know why. We want to know who else are you calling. And you move out a degree of separation. And who are those people calling? 
and you move out a degree of separation. And who are those people calling? And I think when you look at it in those terms, it actually becomes fairly understandable why you couldn't apply for FISA warrants for each of these instances. Because you're talking, you know, at two to three degrees of separation, you're talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Having said that, from a privacy point of view, I'm not sure that that's as unsettling as it might initially seem. Because I mean, I'm personally less upset at the notion that somebody might look at what they call the metadata on an email of mine, so to, from, subject, uh, date, time. Um, I'm less bothered by the idea that, uh, that a computer might sift through that looking for patterns than I am by the notion that somebody might actually listen in on my conversations or read the substance of my email. That said, the problem with this, I think, um, and it's both a problem from the privacy point of view and also if you're from a pragmatic point of view, if you are trying to figure out who Al-Qaeda is calling, uh, is the problem of false positives. That say you do have that call from Afghanistan to New York City and you do start working out by degrees of separation. It just stands to reason that even if you have a terror cell in the United States, a lot of these people are going to be communicating with people in a perfectly innocent way. It could be the person you rent your apartment from. Uh, it could be somebody that you know on your, on your job. And once you start working out, people get kind of ensnared in that associational web. And I think that that is a real danger. And we know, for instance, uh, there have been pieces both in the Times and the Post saying that uh, the NSA would use this program to generate tips. Let's say you basically have leads. And in many cases, those leads would be given to the FBI. And the FBI would actually send people to chase down these leads and find out where the substance was. And the vast majority of these leads ended up being dead ends, to the point where it was actually a joke at the FBI that when they would get this, a new batch of tips from NSA, they would say, more calls to Pizza Hut. Um, <laughs> which, you know, to me, if, if you're the guy at Pizza Hut, and Al Qaeda's not calling you, that's troubling from a privacy point of view. This really does let us zero in on why this whole new world of international terrorists, which are not state, often state controlled or state supported, has become much more complex. When we worry about attacks inside the country, I spent 20 years of my life out supporting operating forces, looking for indications and warning possible attack. And you sort through hundreds to thousands of fragments looking for any lead that might be, and frankly, your intuition to connect them is often the difference. It doesn't surprise me at all that the FBI thought these were useless. They've never been in the indications and warning business. The, they're a wonderful part of our judicial system to carefully assemble evidence to protect it from being tainted, leading to indictment, prosecution, jail. Nothing in that talks about warning. And suddenly they have this flood of the kind of tips that military intelligence people have been accustomed to working with in an entire different for years. And it's a lot of work to run down and discover that maybe one or two have some utility. But if those one or two turn out to be a mom and hot tub for the rest of it, then it may have been worth the time. Now, isn't that a good response to the problems of false positives? Uh, you can have remedies for people who are wrongly identified. If you catch one or two terrorists, that's fine. It's not a privacy objection, though. What about the problem of privacy? The most concrete criticism I've seen of the program is that it might raise uh, something along the lines of the Nixon effect. Basically, just as President Nixon wanted to retaliate against his critics by auditing their tax returns, so this administration could, and some suggest have, uh, looked at the data of its critics and threatened them with retaliatory prosecution. Is that a danger separate from the problem of false positives? Yes, I think so. I mean, the well, certainly it's almost the opposite, right? It's not that you're getting somebody accidentally caught up in the web. It's that the, the program is being co-opted to go out and do this sort of thing. And I think, actually, even before uh, the, the big story about this program, there was some indication that that was happening, that one funny instance of this, uh, which, which uh, we found out about last summer, um, though it didn't raise much of uh, it didn't uh, raise many eyebrows, was in the John Bolton hearings and his confirmation hearings. Um, I mean, again, another problem with the if Al Qaeda is calling you line is that it's actually if Al Qaeda is calling you, and we we are listening to somebody in Afghanistan and they make a call to New York, it was always fine to listen to them. You never even needed to apply for a FISA warrant. What you did was you when you got the intercept of that conversation and you developed a report on it and distributed that report. You redacted the name of the American. So if somebody in Al Qaeda who we're listening to, just in the course of their business, calls me, it's not that they would say, look, he's calling somebody in New York, we have to stop listening. 
what they would do is, in reporting that up, I would, my name would be redacted, and you would get U.S. person. It would, it would always say U.S. person. And in the John Bolton hearings, it emerged that um, on a number of occasions, when he was at the State Department, he would get one of these reports, one of these uh, uh, kind of cleaned up reports in which you have the, the redacted name. And he would basically call over to the NSA, if I understand, and basically say, yeah, that, that U.S. person, who was that? <laughs> and, and, and without any process of review, um, or any showing of, of evidence. In fact, they said the legal standard, the former, former general counsel for the NSA said that the legal standard would be if it would help him better understand the intercepted conversation to know who the other party was. So that was the standard, which I think uh, he tended to satisfy. It turned out that they had done this uh, on 10,000 occasions over an 18-month period uh, between 2004 and 2005. Um, in that case, the worry with somebody like Bolton uh, a, a sharp-elbowed uh, Washington player is that you could actually be, in some cases, listening in to various Beltway adversaries uh, or people that you have pre-existing relationships with. And we know that on at least one occasion, he got one of these reports about some colleague of his, uh, of a conversation the colleague had had with someone the NSA was listening to. And he actually went up to the colleague and congratulated him on his performance in this phone call. Um, I mean, to me, that if, if you're talking about a Nixon effect, yeah, that that to me is a, a troubling a troubling possibility. Just a slight correction. <laughs> <laughs> These are not all conversations. A lot of them are uh, messages back and forth, uh, and those, in fact were from a legitimately approved FISA collection case. But it doesn't lessen the rest of the point. Well, all, all I try to get the audience to understand is that a lot of this isn't just conversations. Some is printed text, uh, some of it emails, the rest of it. So, so you've got, depending on the, the access you have, approach, there may be a whole variety of different ways that these discussions, as opposed to conversations, somebody is reporting home a conversation they had with an assistant secretary of state, and an undersecretary doesn't like, but he's seen the re NSA cannot report, if they report the text, they cannot identify the individual who's there. It's then I'm going back to say, but I need to know that to understand the context. I would have told him no after about the third one. This is helpful, and we now understand that you can have Nixon effects even uh, with warrants. They're not a uh, exactly. protection against this at all. Yeah. Good, but well, we now understand the facts of the program. We've had a tepid, but. Uh, we are going to do broaden our scope of surveillance. They didn't have to get into all the details, and they could have changed the law and nobody would have had a problem with it. And well, tell us about uh, General Hayden. <laughs> um, he's from a working class family in Pittsburgh. Um, small college. I uh, went to uh, officer training OTS for the Air Force. I went to OCS in the Navy. Um, he, um, early on, got assigned to strategic planning activities at the Air Force. Uh, it was not a traditional Air Force career. He ended up um, being uh, National Security Council staff for a period. Um, he was actually, he got promoted up to three stars without the normal command tools. And he was out in Korea as the Deputy United Nations Commander when they were desperately looking for a successor. And they didn't have anybody then functioning in any of the intelligence jobs that they thought could do the job. So he came back, and I think he was even agree. He had a rough first year. Um, but he did prove over time to be somebody who could transform a large organization, um, not without some bumps along the way. Um, even his biggest critics, by the end of his tenure, gave him pretty good marks uh, as a director of NSA. Why he would want be willing 
to undertake this task. Uh, I don't comprehend. Uh, and the attacks are already underway from multiple sources. But the ones that catch my eye are the ones who focus on, well, gee, he doesn't have any human intelligence background. Either did Mr. McCone, either for that matter, did Stansfield Turner in the process. So that is not automatically disqualified. But I guess one of the reasons I have some confidence, in, I loved one of the papers today, talked of the worry that he was too close to Secretary Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld can't abide him because he didn't support him on the legislation. And in fact, made the judgment testified in the committees, he and Jim Clapper, uh, who were both, they were, became non-persons in defense. So if you were looking for somebody who wasn't going to be a captive law, at least for that reason, it was a good choice. Uh, but still, it's, it's an impossible task. I think what it shows, though, is the CIA is now permanently a backbencher. It's kind of formalizes what's been going on in the last couple of years is the CIA, the Bush administration, and the White House in particular, hates the CIA with a passion uh, for really the wrong reasons. They came to the second vice president and Rumsfeld and a number of other people at the White House came to the conclusion a few years ago that the CIA was filled with liberals and uh, who hated you know, who were uh, anti-war, and, you know, they just never really understood the CIA. And they never really tried to understand it, I don't think. And they've managed, under Goss, to essentially break the spirit of the place. And um, now, what, what really, what uh, I think Hayden's, as uh, Admiral said, Hayden and Rumsfeld hate each other, but. Really, Hayden is Negroponte's person there. Yeah. Negroponte, the DNI. This consolidates the view now, the position now, that the CIA is essentially the, a deputy to the DNI. And uh, it helps consolidate Rump uh, Negroponte's standing while he then has to have a fight with Rumsfeld. So. And just for the record, testimony I gave in January of 96, I proposed exactly this kind of change, except I would have gone much further. And that was because I was persuaded at that point that the CIA was already a broken agency. <laughs> and unless you separated the collectors from the analysts, you would never get honest analyst approach because they were always under pressure to make the clandestine collectors look good. Patrick Keith, uh, we've heard that uh, General Hayden was crazy to want to take the job and uh, that the administration should have followed the animal's excellent advice and uh, changed the structure of intelligence gathering long ago. Uh, he has gotten the most trouble for his vigorous and robust defense of the, of the legality of the NSA program. You're a recent graduate of Yale Law School, uh, using the dispassionate uh, objectivity that only Yale was capable of. Tell us. <laughs> is this a close question about whether or not the program is illegal? If it is illegal, tell us why, and if it's not, why not? <laughs> I'm, I'm really struggling to be objective here. I, I don't. And I was perfectly happy to have that. This is in the wake of the Church and Pike Committee times, and I was eager to be able to persuade audiences that in fact the NSA was not doing anything that was not authorized by the courts uh, in the process. And I think that's to me one of the great problems Hayden has politically now is his credibility. He went. As you pointed out, he was in Korea before he was he took the NSA job. And one of the things he told me years ago was that wow, well, right after right about the time that he got the, the word that he was going to take over NSA at the near the end of the Clinton administration, the movie uh, with Will Smith, Enemy of the State, came out, which is I think the first movie really about the NSA. I and mean, there may have been maybe maybe there were some others, I don't know. But it, it made the NSA look like a bunch of murderous thugs who were out to uh, destroy the Republic, basically. Uh, and he, I remember he was very eloquent on the fact that that appalled him, that that image was out there of the NSA, and he realized that the problem the NSA had was that nobody really understood it, and so in this vacuum, you could say all these horrible things about NSA. And when he came into to Fort Meade, 
I think he was one of the, maybe, maybe you did this when you were there, but he was one of the first NSA directors to really make an effort to get to know the press corps in Washington and to really have a public, bring, put the, give the NSA a public face. And he constantly was out there saying, you know, we don't spy on Americans. We never would spy on Americans. We follow the law. And he, his, one of his favorite phrases was, you know, we know that NSA always has two strikes on it, and so we're afraid to go for a third. And, of course, after 9-11, he stopped giving those public speeches. And he left the impression out there that that was still the case. And I think that's one of his problems. He's got a credibility issue. I just had one quick uh, footnote to this. I mean, I um, specifically with this idea of flying in the face of a very specific um, uh, act of, of Congress, um, I probably don't share your optimism if we go back a few minutes about the congressional response to this. Um, I mean, I think that this was a in some respects, I think that this story is part of a larger story about uh, the transformation of, of presidential and executive uh, power uh, in this administration. And, uh, and I think to some extent, uh, Congress has abdicated its role here um, and that it, you, know, you, you in fact have this great insult, which is that the FISA um, is, uh, that we've gone around it. You have, and I think you bring this out uh, really beautifully in your book, that the big debate that we had in the fall of 2001 about the Patriot Act, all of the back, back and forth uh, about the provisions of this big law and, and, uh, and the fighting over uh, the details, was a charade. I mean, all the while, behind the scenes, you had a completely different agenda that was moving along. This, to me, uh, is a sign that, that Congress is, is, I mean, completely, uh, it's, it's a gut punch to Congress. And so it's, it's amazing to me that whereas, uh, during the Church and Pike Commissions, um, you actually had Congress, uh, a very muscular Congress, um, go out there and basically strike back against the executive and assert itself uh, and sort of create the FISA era as we know it. Um, here we have a total abdication, and I thought that, that rather than um, a, a kind of a strong response of the sort that you would expect, instead Congress just folded. Well, it's because you got the same party control. Well, just, yeah. I mean, that's the problem. Well, I, I think you also have a factor here. Uh, when you had Church and Pike come in, um, you had the history of Vietnam, and you had the history of Parking. And therefore, there was a broad public support for constraining the imperial presidency. I watched for 30 years the opinion polls that whatever the issue, a smaller federal government role in our lives always was at the top of the world. Suddenly after 9-11, it dramatically shifted in weeks. And it stayed pretty high. Federal government has to act. Federal government has to do something. And I think that, or if they do nothing else, they read the public opinion polls. And I think that encouraged a shift. And you already had, he's been public about it, the vice president's view that much too much was given away back in the earlier eras. I do think that that's, that's starting to wear off. I, think, I mean, now, one of the things that strikes me is there's now been more time between today and 9-11 than between Pearl Harbor and the end of World War II. And uh, so after five years, I think we got can start to have a debate about how much of these emergency measures and, and this the kind of the, the whole the, the color-coded world that we had, uh, how much we want to keep that as a permanent infrastructure. Well, my word, Jim, is the next attack. Right. And what the nature of that attack is and where it is, and that that could propel us even further yeah. than this one does. <laughs> but I think Iraq has kind of poisoned the well on the politi political side of that. Anything overseas, mm -hmm. but another attack inside the country. I, I have some worries yeah. about where it might take the country. Well, this debate that uh, James Rice and Patrick Keefe are having uh, raises the central question, who will save us? Will it be Congress or the courts? Who is more likely to impose the kind of oversight that it sounds like all of you agree is necessary? So uh, I'll ask all of you, uh, I guess I'll start with you, Admiral. You are in Congress now. Yeah. You are a solon of moderation. You run the Senate Judiciary Committee. What bill would you propose, and could it realistically be adopted in this political climate? 
I believe you can get a modification to FISA, which delegates, whether it's to the director of national intelligence or the director of NSA, under a very clear set of circumstances, surprise attacks, other things, that you have the authority to initiate surveillance. And you must come to the court in 90 days and show exactly how you used it and what you got. But the most important part for this conversation is what inadvertent collection of U.S. citizens did you get? What you do with it? And so it's obvious to you, and I, I'm more comfortable with the courts. I just think the nation is stronger when you have the balance of the three parts. Do you think that the suggestion that you've uh, offered should be imposed by the courts? Should the Supreme Court well, say that? Courts can't do it. Congress has to enact it. Congress enacts it and the courts administer it. And then the courts administer it. Okay, that's all. Um, and there's some people in the Congress who are attracted to the idea. Do you think, though, one of the problems the administration now has is that if they don't work with Congress to modify FISA anytime soon, and if they kind of, if the, the, if the legislative work stalls, that the courts will have no choice but to deal with this as being outside FISA, and that there will be legal challenges that will then be more damaging to the administration than it would be if they dealt with Congress on this. Absolutely. And you're, th this is really going to ultimately be a test of whether the president walks away from the vice president on this issue. If they elect to work with Congress, it's because he finally decided he needed to move into the world. <laughs> Patrick, there are lawsuits pending. Uh, the ACLU has filed one, joined by such luminaries as Christopher Hitchens, uh, and James Bamford, and others, uh, uh, and other uh, legal scholars of that uh, ilk. Uh, they keep records of it to come back. It was a cookie that they put on the track. I wonder, has this younger generation simply, knowing that that takes place, are they less sensitive on this issue of privacy than some of us old guys? There are some very interesting polls suggesting that young people like to be naked much more than older. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually one of, you may know this, but I, remember, I did hear one of the things that was interesting, I've never confirmed this, but I've heard that, you know, within the NSA, among the very few people who knew about this program, there were, there was some concern, serious concerns, some people considered resigning, some people 